Hey, man, how's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. And what about yourself? Well, uh, going pretty well, man. Um, look, uh, welcome to the to the podcast. Uh, this is something uh, that we've been wanting to do for a long time, but uh, just finally got around, um, you know, talking to interesting people like you, yourself. And uh, uh, yeah, let's get started, man. Um, uh, first of all, where are you right now? Uh, right now, I'm just outside of Amsterdam, in uh, in the Netherlands. It's pretty much where Ooh. where I'm based for the for the for the most <laughs> part. But I, I I hoon around a bit, so oh, wow, <laughs> never wow. quite sure where I am. <laughs> yeah, that's why I asked. Um, yeah, how's how's things uh, in uh, good old uh, Amsterdam, man? I'm getting a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a bit over winter. It's just starting to break, but it's uh, Amsterdam and the Netherlands. It's it's fantastic in the summer. Long days, lots of festivals, lots of partying. But during the winter, it's just kind of short days. <laughs> very cloudy, very rainy. So I'm looking forward to to, to making my escape. I've got to, speaking at a conference in Croatia next week, so. I'm, oh, wow. uh, I'm looking forward to looking forward to that. That's going to be awesome, man. What's what's the conference? It's B sides Croatia or B sides Zagreb. So B sides is I think they started in Vegas uh, with Defcon and Black Hat. The idea being that it was like there a lot of people that wanted to speak didn't get in, so it was the B side of the record. And now they're all around the world. Usually they're attached to a larger conference. Um. And and as a smaller kind of more technical geeky version of the big conference, so RSA has one and uh, and so on. So, uh, but yeah, now they're pretty much a standalone a standalone thing. So that's gonna be it's gonna be cool to kind of talk to some other uh, some other hackers and uh, fellow geeks and uh, geek out for a bit in Croatia. Yeah, yeah, I saw that um, a while back uh, when they announced it. Um, at, um, so. Um... As you know, uh, I'm also involved with B sides. Uh, we we started B side Sydney a while back, and uh, um, it has been going pretty well. So yeah, I, I actually personally like B sides. Um, I get to you get to mingle and you know talk, and um, it's it's a I think it's a bit bit of that uh, casualness attached to, the, to to those conferences that make it pretty pretty cool. Um, uh, whereas you know you go and you usually get blinded by the lights and all that in Black Hat and Defcon and bigger <laughs> conferences. Um, whereas the B size has that subtle sort of, you know, uh, very casual feel to it. So I, I really love B size. Um, Some of the bigger conferences can really feel like death by a thousand vendors. And like when you're going through there, it feels yeah. very commercial where B sides B sides, you know, they have some sponsors, but it, it really feels like the you know that uh, the pe- the the conference is about the people. So, so it's yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it's and a cool. lot of a lot of sponsors understand that as well now. Um, uh, so that's a that's a good thing. Uh, like the sponsors we've had at B Side Sydney, um, pretty much just came in uh, to help out. Um, you know, not to sell. Um, a lot of them didn't even have their salespeople there, to be honest. And uh, you know, they were more a part of the community um, and a lot of their sort of uh, vendor booths were kind of being managed by uh, tech tech people as well. So it really was, um, you know, a very friendly sort of uh, not trying to sell anything type uh, atmosphere, which was pretty cool. Uh, I mean, you were there, so <laughs> you would have seen that. <laughs> I was there. Yeah, that was, uh, that was it was, it's, it, they are always cool conferences and, I work for a vendor called Geek Guardian, and, and we, you know, we we spent the, I think it's like fifty grand or something to get the booth at Black Hat and things. We've given up on that, and we're we're sponsoring B sides and OL stuffs. And it's not even about uh, having your wares there. It's just about kind of if you're an active part of the community, people and you have positive name brand association, people will give you the time of day. And if you spend fifty grand on a Black Hat booth, then like. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you're not going to get that. And they go up. They, I, well, last time I was at Black Hat, they had the. Um, I went to the auctions just to check out what's happening because 
it's like the second day of the conference at midday, they do an auction for the big sites. So you don't even know how much it's going to cost you to get like a big booth. It could be a hundred grand. It could be 400 grand. They had this auction and it, it, to try and make all the vendors feel really pressured and they haven't even had a full conference to kind of make their decision yet. So the whole thing feels pretty, besides it's, I mean, Black Hat's cool, but it feels, it just feels so like a money grab at the end of the day. Yeah, there uh, there goes our Black Hat sponsorship. But um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I, yeah, look, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, Matt. I've been there. Uh, I've also spoken at Black Hat. Um, so I do totally understand. I totally understand and get that. Um, but at the same time, I mean, personally, I think the bigger sort of, uh, you know, Black hat type conferences do have their place in the industry um, for, you know, certain reasons and uh, certain audiences and all that. Uh, a lot of cool stuff comes out of them as well, um, uh, as far as like research and all that goes. But yeah, that that whole uh, vendor sort of uh, vendor festi feel uh, is also attached to it. I guess they kind of go hand in hand. Um, you know, you got to make money to put up these big shows. And I'm pretty sure, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you're talking about RSA, for example, um, the amount of money they spend on uh, venues and catering alone would be, I don't, I don't even matter, we're running to millions, I think. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, so it's a bit of a, both of the things, you know, combined. I, definitely right. I think if you have the money, if you're a big company, if you're Sentinel One or, you know, like then, then absolutely spend that money on it. But, but I think if, if you're, if you're still establishing yourself as a brand, I think it's better to go for smaller conferences that are more focused on communities. Um, but that's because I'm part of those communities. So look, I'm always going to be biased and I've got nothing against Black Hat and RSA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, man. Um, oh, just, just keen to like um, for, for the listeners. Uh, so McKinsey and I uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, spent some time together back in November when he uh, traveled down to Sydney in Australia uh, McKinsey uh, presented his research at Hack Sydney um, last year. He also uh, uh, did a talk in uh, at B Side Sydney. So he he hung he hung around for a few days in Sydney. Uh, that was pretty cool. So we met at Hack Sydney. And then we also met at B Sides again. Uh, I got to know McKinsey pretty well during those um, those conferences, and uh, uh, it's really cool to. Uh, uh, be talking to you again, Matt. Uh, you know, uh, it's only been a few months, but uh, still, a lot has happened in those months. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, what were your thoughts on Sydney in general, um, and uh, you know, uh, the conferences that that uh, you attended back in November? So, look, it was a, it was a very cool vibe, and I think the context around like. Sydney had just had, I mean, Australia had just kind of had the the, the Optus breach with the exposed oh, APIs, yeah, yeah. and you'd also had the Medibank breach. So, you know, like I think that's important context when you're coming into to it because because people were really were really there to to, to figure to figure it out, um, and and I think a lot of people felt like there was uh, a lot of vulnerabilities, kind of in in the sector which is true for anywhere it just happens to be uh after after a big breach where people make a lot of effort so that that was really cool because i mean not not that the breaches were cool but what was cool about it is that people weren't coming into the conference to hang out or to try and get their work to buy a 300 hundred dollar ticket so that they could uh you know just escape for a little bit people were there to actually implement change and learn about this and i think that that feel uh was was really cool and um you know i i i wrote an article about it at the end and because i really felt like this was kind of pivotal time in australian cybersecurity space because everyone was kind of aware that change needs to happen um and and now was the time to do it uh and so it was it was very interesting but i definitely felt like it was a, a period of implementation so the people that were at the conference were were really kind of looking for things that they could do to implement and to 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 further on cybersecurity in australia at general so that was kind of the, the the general the general vibe that i got and i i definitely i definitely that's that's 
that's a, that's exactly what you want as a, as a speaker because you know it's it conversations happen quickly at the end of it people are asking the right amount of questions the right people are there the ones that can actually affect change and and deepen cyber security so very interesting very interesting conversations to have around it so i thought that the whole sydney uh, kind of vibe was was really cool and having the two conferences right next to each other meant that you could actually it wasn't just high and by you could you know you had one conference uh and then you you know i think five days later you had the other one so you could actually uh, set up some meetings in between that was pretty cool as well it kind of affects change so i think everything was set up so that okay change can actually happen now we're not just donor conference so that we can take a box get a, a professional service point we can actually uh we can actually implement some changes in the organization and in, in, in Australia tech sector. Yeah, that was, that was, that was sort of the plan as well. Uh, I mean, obviously we, we, we had nothing to do with the breaches. Uh, they just kind of happened uh, completely coincident <laughs> based, uh, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> but uh, it was, uh, again, you know, the breaches were not cool, but it was kind of cool that, um, you know, the conferences were sort of happening right after those. Uh, so there was a lot to talk about. There was a lot to discuss. Um, and uh, we did sort of set up the whole thing in a way where, again, you know, going back to the history of B-Sides, uh, I have been involved with B-Sides for many, many years now. Uh, you know, I presented at a few uh, back in you know, France and UK and all that and started to Sydney. Um, so it's so like you like you touched upon it a little bit earlier. You know, the B sides came out of, uh, you know, DEF CON and Black Hat. Uh, well, basically, there was a lot of, really good submissions that didn't make the cut for for the um the actual conferences at you know black hat and defcon and uh, uh people like jack daniel for example or uh, who's, who's one of the founders of b-sides um or um coming from a point of view where hey these are really cool um submissions but they didn't make it uh it'll be a bit, bit of a waste to not not having them you know uh, come out and speak about this stuff. So they started this whole B-Sides thing um, based on that and got all these guys, um, you know, to present at B-Sides. Uh, and obviously it grew into something which is just, uh, well, now it's so big and, uh, you know, it's basically every city's got one uh, pretty much. Um, so the whole idea of us doing this the way we did back in November last year was also kind of replicate that in a way where, you know, we can have rather than just a Sydney conference thing, we could have a bit of a Sydney uh, security, cybersecurity infosec type week where, yeah, especially people like yourself, right? And uh, back in Hack Sydney, you would you'd have seen there were a lot of uh, international uh, speakers and attendees who uh, were coming from uh, UK, Europe, for example, like yourself, uh, Israel, uh, lots of uh, people from New Zealand. So if they're making that effort to come all the way to Australia, which is a pretty long flight <laughs> for someone coming from Europe or America, uh, might as well get uh, as much value out of that trip as you can. Um, so we kind of married this whole thing together. Um, and uh, this year we're actually planning to do it even um, better from a, from a scheduling point of view where it, might be something like um, Hack Sydney starts on a Thursday um, and it goes on to Friday. Uh, we finish it off Friday night and the Saturday we do the B sides and you know it's like bang, 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 everything done together. Mm. So if someone like you is coming in on a Monday, you've got at least three days to you know get used to the <laughs> new time zone or whatever, and get a few meetings done, and then finish it off on a weekend and then you know off you go sort of thing. Um, so it's it's good to know that you know it kind of worked out the way we planned last year. Um, we were really stoked, man, uh, when we saw uh, all the few guys coming in. I mean, the international participation was something that was quite surprising. Like if you look at the speaker lineup, man, we had people from um, uh, we came from Amsterdam. We had people from America. UK, Israel, a bunch of people from New Zealand, um, lots of interstate people uh, like Thomas uh, traveled from Melbourne, for example. 
um, it turned out to be a pretty, pretty, pretty great um, gathering of people. And uh, the mix of people was pretty solid as well, right? We had you, um, then we had a bunch of offensive guys, and then we had a bunch of um, defensive guys, um, some policy type people. It ended up being exactly the way we would have wanted it to be, but didn't have enough confidence or <laughs> didn't wanted to jinx it too much by you know, expecting too much. Mm. Um, so that was really cool, man. Yeah, I, definitely. And I think in the context of like Australia just being locked down for so long, uh, kind of not being able to have these physical events, plus the breaches, like it was the perfect storm for everyone just to be like, okay, we need to, <laughs> we need to get, we need to get involved in this. And I think that, that was, uh that was really cool did, did b-side yeah. sydney this wasn't the first one you'd you'd, you'd run a b-side sydney before or was this the first b-sides sydney that you, uh, you ran? no so we started back in 2019 um and right. uh, i'll give you a little bit of a story uh if you're interested or if the listeners are interested how it actually started so i knew about b-sides for many 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 years as most of uh, most of us did uh so I used to work for a company called Tenable. Uh, back in the day, no one knew about Tenable when I was there. Uh, we just used to say we worked for Nessus because everyone knew Nessus. <laughs> um, and Jack Daniel, one of the co-founders of B-Sides, uh, also used to work at Tenable uh, at the time that I was there. So obviously, I knew about B-Sides and all that stuff. And um, later on, I started to, when I started speaking at conferences and sharing my research and all that, so I did a few B-Sides uh, uh, talks overseas. And I think it was B-Sides France uh, when uh, I did the talk. It was a really small B-Sides. I think it was the first B-Sides or maybe maybe the second one uh, where I was in France. Uh, it was in France. Um, it was in Bordeaux, so <laughs> beautiful part of France. Uh, and I did the talk, and afterwards, uh, you know, as you do, you you just linger around and talk to people and all that. And a lot of people came up and say, "Ah, oh, that was, you know, the usual stuff. Oh, really good talk, man. Um, I enjoyed and all that." And uh, pretty much everyone had this next question, uh, which was, uh, "When is B side Sydney?" Um, and I don't know why people just sort of expected it to be there. Maybe it's because, you know, Sydney is a pretty major city in the world and, you know, most even smaller cities nowadays have B-sides and they were like, when is B-side Sydney? And I just got sick of just telling people that there is no B-side Sydney, um, um, you know, and then I thought uh, we, we should do something about it. And I got in touch with Jack and I was like, hey, man, what's the story with B-side Sydney? And he was like, uh, it just never happened. I was like, that's pretty, pretty, pretty strange. That's such a big city, such a major city in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, so he just said uh, a few people actually tried. Um, domains were registered and stuff like that happened, but it just never sort of uh, got off the ground. Uh, so I asked him, uh, what do you reckon? Can, can, can I do it? And he was like, yeah, yeah, go for it. We, we, there's no dramas with that. So I, um, I teed up with John and I was like, um, Matt, uh, do you want to help me with this? And John was all in. Long story short, we started it um, back in 2019. We did the first one. Uh, it went really well. We had uh, pretty, a lot of really good speakers, lots of, um, again, you know, uh, felt like the population was really crying out for, for besides Sydney because we didn't have anything. Uh, so yeah, all the tickets were gone in a matter of, you know, hours and all that stuff, all the usual <laughs> stuff with conferences, uh, good conferences. And, uh, we put up a pretty good show. Uh, we had really good feedback. Uh, we were lucky enough to get a pretty solid, uh, keynote speaker. We got, um, uh, Jeff Banner, who's, uh, who leads the U S cyber command, uh, to, to come down, fly down to Australia and give that, uh, keynote. It was a big hit, so we were like, "Okay, we, we're off, right?" Uh, and this this was a huge success. Uh, we we're unstoppable now, <laughs> and then everyone knows what happened next year, right? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, but basically, well, we, we couldn't do it for the next couple of years. Uh, so it started pretty good, and then COVID uh, kind of you know um, took over for the next couple of years. We couldn't do it in 2020, obviously 2021, we were hoping we could do it. And then, you know, the new strains came out and lockdowns happened again. And, uh, basically just, uh, yeah, uh, we couldn't have done it basically, uh, in 2021 as well. Mm. Uh, 
lockdowns and stuff. So finally, we got to do it in 2022, um, towards the end of it. And uh, so that's a really long answer to your question, but it was the second one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a cool story. It's a cool story. It feels, yeah, there's, a, there's so many B-sides everywhere. We, we, we were even wondering about starting one uh, for Paris because there's no B-sides Paris. Uh, which kind of feels, and there's there's a lot of really cool conferences uh, in Paris. There's uh, 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 Hack Hack Paris, I think it's like Hack Sydney, but I think they stole your name. But yeah, uh, yeah, but Hack, uh, Paris it's Hack in Paris. <laughs> Hack in Paris. Hack in Paris. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> there we go. That's a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot. There's there's a lot of conferences that it could be cool to attach a B sides to because they have their own community, their own feel. Uh, but we're, so we were looking into it, but it, but it, it's kind of like that classic thing. Everyone gets really excited by it, and then it's kind of like, oh, we have to put the down payment down on the, on the place, and then on the, oh, we have to kind of get the website up, and who's going to do this, and then everything just kind of becomes, you know, it's difficult yeah. to run a conference, and and there's risk involved, you know, like there's 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 risk yeah. involved, and in, in, at every kind of step, you have to, you have to be pretty confident that people are going to show up to it. So you know, I yeah. did too. You did two in one year, so <laughs> you must yeah, have stressed time... a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't uh, wasn't uh, very easy. Um, uh, a lot of times, people ask me, "How did you like? How do you get these things off the ground?" And I kind of half joke when I tell them, "You got to be um, either drunk enough to, you know, register that domain and put a down payment down, uh, or you got to have a set of people that, uh, you know." Uh, really there uh, to, to help you out. In our case, it's just uh, John and I for the most part up until now. Um, we're really lucky. So you were uh, drunk when you put the day down? Oh, 100%, 100%, <laughs> man. Completely, completely out of our minds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it took me a while to understand what that uh, what that transaction on my credit card was for. But uh, yeah. <laughs> We were lucky that we've always had a lot of uh, community support. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, support from, um, uh, like this year, as you as you saw, uh, UTS, uh, you know, uh, very generously um, offered their their venues for us and uh, uh, at the university. So that was pretty cool. Uh, the UTS team, the Cybersecurity Society, big shout out to them. Um, they they helped so much. You would have seen uh, those guys you know, all over the, the conference. Uh, so we were lucky in that sense, uh, and that that again is a uh, an idea I got off another B sides because uh, I actually uh, uh, presented at uh, B sides Bristol, and that entire conference was done at the University of Bristol. Um, so when I came back, I was like, we should we should reach out to the universities and see because the whole idea of us doing B sides is obviously not to make money; it's a not for profit venture completely. Um, and wherever we can save money is 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 huge, right? It goes a long way. Um, mm-hmm. So this you you were a speaker, so you probably don't even know this, but this year, uh, besides uh, the entire conference was free to attend um, because you know we had just enough money from the sponsors and UTS gave us the venue, um, so we were able to pull it off, and uh, that was pretty cool that we were we were able to do that. Um, um yeah hopefully uh we no, can I, do something similar i was very aware that it was free because oh. <laughs> uh i'd gotten into hack sydney first and then i was like oh no it's gonna be fine because like it's a long trip but four days later there's b-sides and at that point i wasn't really planning you know like uh, i was, I was gonna submit some a, a speaking proposal but i was like i just want to go to that and it kind of had it on the back of my mind. And then at one point I was like, oh, i got to get some tickets. And then I went on and I was like, what, they're all gone? <laughs> it's been like two days since they opened up. So well, They were going so in two hours, hours, mate. They were all going in two yeah, hours. I, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I was very aware of the ticket situation. And then I think yeah. you got an email from me like, hey, mate, are you accepting proposals for a B-side? <laughs> 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 yeah. No, that's... Uh... I don't know, man. That's that's a bit of a two-edged sword as well. We found out later because um, it's really good to do something like that where you're uh, getting people like basically free tickets. You know, it's it's a community thing. You shouldn't have to pay for this if you don't have to. But at the same time, um, we did get 
a bunch of people just taking the piece, um, you know, just didn't show up. Not showing up. Not showing up. So yeah, that's, I was... that really sucks because you're taking someone else's place. And just because it's free and, you know, whatever, you know, you don't feel like waking up on a Sunday morning or whatever and you don't show up. That that's that sucks. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, you know, it makes you wonder, like, what's the best way to do it? Even just charging 20 bucks, people are kind of committed. And if people can't pay the 20 bucks, you could have a, you know, a, a request sponsorship type form where people go down that route, they get a sponsored ticket. At least they feel, they feel special, right? They, you know, like they yeah. they had to fill in a form, they had to request it, you know, so that people can still come, but the people are committed. But yeah, no, I get what you mean. It still felt very... Uh, Still felt full, like the the rooms were, were were full for a lot of the for a lot of the talks. Um, so really good. Yeah. There was a great diversity in there. Yeah, I mean, you guys had some technical talks, and then you also had uh, that awesome guy that uh, I forget his name, but he was he had brought with him all the Enigma old Enigma machines and was explaining cryptography, oh, like yeah, cryptography that was... throughout throughout the period and spy yeah. stuff, and they had all these toys of him. Like I was like, damn, that's cool. That was really cool. Yeah, <laughs> that, that room was, was one packed. Of the <laughs> Yeah, hundred percent. That was one of the coolest talks I met. Uh, just just to be able to see those things was uh, uh, super cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. But back on that thing. Um, so this year we we'll probably make it like like exactly what you were saying, and a lot of people have said this um, like a twenty bucks sort of a ticket where you know it doesn't really you know, breaks the bank or you know not too hard for most of the people in cybersecurity. I guess twenty bucks is not that much of a money mm. uh, problem, uh, but uh, at the same time we kind of feel a bit more committed. Because the problem is really just that, right? Even if, you know, 50 people don't show up, that's 50 people that could have gone there. And, um, you know, we had a long waiting list as well. So we could have had those people uh, in there. And it's just, it, it, it's not, it's not cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can imagine that would be very frustrating uh, to do it. Yeah. It is a shame, but uh, you, you could also kind of imagine someone, someone's interested, they reserve their ticket in the, they go out in the town on the Friday night, Saturday, and they, yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they never were going to show up, but they have an excuse now, you know. So, I mean, it's a, yeah, yeah, it's a problem. Oh. Yeah. Oh well. Oh well. Uh, what else is happening in your world, man? How how's uh, how's GitHub looking? Uh, you guys keeping it secure? <laughs> yeah, we are. We we're actually just about to release uh, 9th of March date at the moment so we're about to release our our, our big kind of research project for last year so i work for for git guardian and we we scan our we work in code security but one of the things that we do and i I guess it's kind of something we're known for because it gives us a lot to talk about is that we we scan every commit that goes through github so if you don't know github is a code sharing platform it's the largest in the world it's about 100 million developers that use it and you kind of, if you're in tech, you need to use GitHub because it's it's almost like a portfolio of your work. It's where all the open source projects are committed to, like well, at least 90% of them. And so, you know, a commit or a contribution to code is is kind of, you know, uploading code to GitHub, basically. And that happens a billion times every year. So it's just a constant stream of fire hose of information. We scan all of it. So we scan all of it to to make sure that uh, that there's no code vulnerabilities in there. So on the 9th of March, we release what we find, and we find some <laughs> we find some really interesting things uh, there. So I can't give you the results, but the first year that we released the report, we found two million credentials, two million secrets. Last year, so throughout 2021, so last year when we released our report, we found six million. It wasn't quite a three times increase because we had expanded our scopes. Yeah. Uh, and then this year, this year we've found a lot. That's all I, a lot, yeah. a lot of uh, really interesting things. And we've teamed up actually with a couple of different organizations too. We have some research from Cyber News in there. We have some research from a company called Dark Owl that focuses on uh, dark, the scanning of the dark web. And so we're yeah. kind of putting all this together in a report. So yeah, it's pretty scary. It's pretty scary the opportunities that attackers have to be able to find uh, this information, and 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 we're learning more about how it's processed because, you know, a lot of people kind of think that they're protected by obscurity. Like, hey, no one's really interested in my personal project. No one's going to 
to to find out if I leaked something, right? But but what happens is you have people that are just like us scanning all of GitHub, obtaining all this information. They're not the ones that are going to launch an attack because they're the ones that that, that are going to sell that information on on the dark web. So you, you have multi layers and steps of this. So it's kind of like the first group is just after everything. And the second group, they want to buy specific credentials for specific people in specific country companies. So you want some Google credentials? Well, I have a list of a million credentials that we found last year. I have 150 from Google employees. You take those. They're they're a thousand bucks. And that's what happens. So it's 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 kind of and we're with with uh with Dark How we're able to kind of track this. To see it, to see how actually these things get exposed and end up uh, being sold, it's pretty, ah, pretty freaky. I gotta say, it's pretty scary. Pretty scary stuff, man. Um, and uh, it's it's crazy how, because you know, uh, I remember going back a few years. Um, you know, uh, this is this started coming up where you know people would commit code and credentials would end up on GitHub and. It was uh, mm. a bit of a problem and all that stuff. And then all these things came up, you know, uh, third-party technologies, people, smart people at, you know, um, cool companies um, started building their own sort of uh, tools um, or started writing their own script that would try to sort of, uh, you know, prevent that. And then uh, GitHub also released their own, uh, you know, uh, features and tools that would that would scan for, say, for example, credentials and stuff like that, and alert the people. Uh, but looks like it's done basically nothing, right? Because uh, it's it's growing every year, like you just said. Uh, it's it's pretty scary. So, what do you think is is happening there? Is it? It used to be devs were just being not careful or you know, whatever. I don't want to use the word lazy, mm-hmm. but uh, just not being careful. And uh, it's important to, you know, point this out that a lot of people blame devs for security problems, uh, which should not be the way. Uh, it's not their job. Uh, yeah, they, they need to follow the whole, you know, SDLC and try to make the uh, whole life cycle as secure as possible. But at the same time, you know, there's, there's uh, other people who specialize in that and, you know, they should be reviewing the code and all that. But uh, basically what was happening was, you know, um, devs were not being careful or whatever, and they were you know, committing code without checking or without confirming, and credentials would end up on GitHub. Um, do you think that still is a problem? It's exactly the same problem that's still happening, and it still needs sort of similar uh, approach to solutions where you either have um, you know a sec team that's uh, basically you know reviewing code before it ends up on github or using tools that do that for them uh, what's happening there cuz this thing is not going down uh, like you just said it's you know mm. three times more last year this year it's probably 10 times more so what do you reckon is happening there well you know it's there's a lot that that goes into this and there's a couple of reasons what what triggers the increase and why it's not improving. So, like first of all, we've we've changed so much how we uh, how we use these secrets. So, you know, we're we're becoming more and more of a, of a of an architecture of microservices and microsystems, which all connect in third party services. And each year that expands, you know, we have you know our IDEs are even going online now. You know, we're 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 connecting all these different uh, systems and pipelines and CI/CD. All of this requires secrets. All of this requires everyone to handle a lot more secrets. So, ten years ago, developers weren't handling secrets as much as they are now. Now they're integral to everything. And then, and then the second part is not is not almost kind of developers being lazy and making mistakes. It's actually just misunderstandings of how Git even works. So. For example, uh, you know, like people don't don't realize that when when you make a, a project, when you have a private project and you make it public, right? You do all these code reviews. You make sure all the code is spotless and crystal clean. But you're only doing that for one layer. You're doing that for the latest version of uh, of uh, of of your of your application. So what does that what does that mean? That means that like you have all this history. That also is a risk to you that oh, people don't okay. think about. Yep. So it's um, it's 
it, so when something goes when something goes yeah public then you, there's there's much more there's much more depth to the security risks than I think people people realize. And you know, and, and same when you're working on a development branch, you hard code credentials just to to check that they're working. You remove those credentials, and uh, and then you commit your code. In the code review, those credentials won't show up because you've removed them, but they're in your history. They're in some obscure dev branch that no one's going to check, right? So that's it's kind of misunderstandings of how of how this happens. And uh, yeah, and there's some unique things about GitHub. We have usually have one account for our personal use and our professional use. So we use the same credentials for our company as our private organize as our private kind of work. This makes it really easy to accidentally have the wrong remote locally on your machine, and you can push corporate code to a public repository. Um, you know, very very easily, you copy something into the wrong area. All, all of these things kind of contribute to that. So it's. For for this to to get better, we kind of need to fundamentally change a lot of uh, a, a lot of how we kind of build and and architect our our applications. That's 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 one of the the, the key things that we really need to do. So, when you, what do you mean when um, uh, I understand the history part of it, right? And you know, there could be you mm-hmm. know, a lot of shit in the history that ends up on um, when you when you make it public and all that. But what about like uh, releases and all that? That's separate to it, right? Or is that a part of it as well? So basically the last release you had, you had some stuff in there that shouldn't have been there, but it's sort of, you know, has been archived and it's available in, as a release. And now you've right. got this completely new set of, uh, you know, code or whatever, and you've uh, released a new version of it. Uh, when you make the whole thing public, do by default... Does everything, like all the releases from the past, become public as well? Everything, yeah. You can squash your history. You can, you can do that. Oh, okay. um, but there's a reason. There's a reason why we, we, why we have history, right? That's so that we can quickly go back to different versions. If something breaks, yeah. and yeah. we release something into production, and then half of our customers are saying, "Hey, this latest release is broken," version control allows you to quickly go back release a new version that was to the last time everything was working and do it. it's important yeah. to have history there. Yeah. Uh, it also helps when you're trying to figure out what to do next. It's kind of like, uh, Oh, have we considered this approach? And then you can go, Oh, we were working on that somewhere. And then you look at the code. Oh, and then here's where they stopped. This is the issue that they came up with. Right. So, yeah. So that's uh, every, so that's why all the history always kind of comes forward and people say, Oh, why don't you just squash your history? Well, that's kind of defeating the whole purpose, you know, yeah. that's, that's the same as kind of like just having a new project. Right. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of like why, why, why that, that, that happens in that way. And so, yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things is public GitHub and that's what we do a lot of, but that's the tip of the iceberg when it comes to private repositories. And attackers are really going after developers now. You can circle CI was breached. There were like there's developer tools, you know, DevOps tools. Like these are the things that are really attackers are going after. Um, because w- we know that there's thousands of secrets in private repositories because people aren't as careful in public. So the, the problem and getting into a getting into your source code is much easier than trying to get access into your uh, you know a secure network because uh, every single one of your employees has GitHub access uh, to your private organization or Bitbucket or GitLab or whatever they're using. You know that a lot of a lot of your development teams all have access to this. I just need to compromise one of your developers to be able to gain access to that source code. Um, it's on local machines. It's in backups. It's on wikis. I got lots of places I can try and find it. Uh, so it's the the private repositories are kind of really really where the scary stuff is because yeah, public. We can talk about it. We can show you scary numbers. There's huge amounts of volume. Yep, we can show you how attackers use this. But it's really like that just re- reiterates the purpose of, but it's private repositories that are like really scary. And I mean, like how many breaches did we see last year where they released a source code? Microsoft, NVIDIA, Samsung, Twitch. All of these companies had their source code leaked uh, last year because uh, you know attackers were able to 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 ransom it and then whether ransom was paid or not they they uh, they just released publicly the 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 information yeah that's 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 pretty scary stuff man and uh, 
the other thing as well is like just imagine how much not imagine you probably know this already um, you know how much code actually resides on github today and uh, how much of it is really critical um you know um code basically you know looking after critical systems and stuff like that and uh, just just um imagine if um, some bad actor was able to get into github like uh, like properly pawn it or you know find a big exploit that actually works um it'd be mm. a bit of a disaster wouldn't it um because at the moment by whatever oh. they're doing um you know about uh, getting access to individual accounts and all that even then it's it's so bad but and there might actually even be something that's just not disclosed. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty. Well, uh, it, well GitHub did have a GitHub did have a breach recently, and it wasn't quite so bad. But but you know this is something though after. But it doesn't even need to be Git, GitHub. Like for instance, uh, CodeCov is a is a code coverage tool. So uh, it sits in a CI/CD pipeline. So basically, when you release code, you can run all these checks to make sure that the code's working correctly. One of those checks is to is to basically check how much of your code is being checked. Right? You want hundred percent code coverage, which means I'm testing one hundred percent of my code. Code CodeCov is just a tool that lets you know how much you're being tested. It's like very very niche tool in your CI/CD pipeline. An important tool to have, but nothing like super critical. Can you explain CI/CD breach. pipeline for the for the listeners? Yeah, sure. So a CI/CD pipeline is basically when I commit code. It stands for continuous integration and continuous deployment. And what that means is that when I commit code, a whole bunch of things are automatically going to be fired off. So it's going to check that all well, my code is working. It's going to check for any security vulnerabilities. It's going to check for uh, that, that, that you know, you don't have any broken links and, and that every everything you haven't introduced, any kind of errors that are going to pop up. So it's going to test your application for you. And then it's going to deploy it. So then it's going to package it and ship it off. This means that every time you commit code, you can create a new release. It, it takes the hassle out of it. It's, it's really important and enables us to, to move faster. So in this CI CD, you've got all these different components doing different things. One of them was probably checking to see how much of your code is being tested. Very, very niche. Nothing that has critical access to anything. So nothing that you're kind of really thinking too much about. But this company, CodeCov, uh, was breached. Their application was turned malicious. And what that did was it basically, uh, when you're, it's a little bit difficult to explain, but when you're testing your application, you need to build your application. Therefore, you need to connect to your database, your code. So you need lots of secrets. You need lots of credentials. They're securely stored but they are still stored. Basically, what the attackers did was because this application was running in the CI/CD pipeline, they were able to send all of those credentials to the attacker, and the attacker was then able to kind of access your private GitHub repositories or whatever VCS you're using, access all your source code, because this one component was turned malicious. So, so just one small thing was turned malicious, and then they attackers were able to get all the keys to your kingdom and then get access into your private infrastructure like your source code. So like it doesn't even need to be GitHub that, that's turned malicious. It could be, and Circle CI had a massive breach re this year. So this is a, another thing that could, that really could, could be significant. So it's, there's a lot of things, <laughs> there's a lot of things that can go wrong. I know that's a little bit technical, but, but basically the, the point is, is that you don't even need to do anything wrong for you to be breached, it could just be a third-party system that you're using. Yeah, we saw that just uh, as we woke up this morning uh, uh, with this. I don't know if you've even seen it uh, by now. Uh, the Atlassian uh, breach that happened. Uh, oh, what? Yeah, so this, <laughs> I, I think it just came out uh, uh, early this morning, uh, uh, our time in Australia. Uh, well, basically, a third-party app that was. Uh, breached and they were able to get into Atlassian and uh, really weird stuff, man. They released to some um, floor plans of their offices and uh, they also released <laughs> some, um, uh, some PI related to the employees. Um, um, so yeah, like exactly what you were explaining before, right? Um, you do everything the right way and then, you know, some third party app that you're using. Um, 
has a problem uh, <laughs> that gets exploited and uh, you end up uh, with a big problem Jeez. of your own. Yeah. So that was just breaking this morning, uh, which was, uh, yeah, it's always uh, sad to sort of, you know, wake up to news like that, um, especially for yeah, us. Yeah, the season's having a bad day. Yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, hey, um, with the with so you you guys um, um, basically continuously scan GitHub, right? And I'm assuming that most of that or a bulk of it is, like you said, just the public GitHub. What about the private ones? Does that mean you have to have some sort of a contract with the owner of the repository, and then they give you permission to scan it, or how, how does that work? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, if you're just an individual and you have private repositories, uh, then you, you you probably have lots of different uh, different tools that scanning your software for for various things. So, you can easily integrate secret detection or other code vulnerability detection in there. Where it gets really tricky is like if you have large corporations, and that's because code is usually like self hosted, so that you create your own kind of version of GitHub or GitLab locally. Uh, that, that, that that you run and control, right? Because when you get large enough, you stop trusting other companies. So then it becomes more difficult to integrate, uh, you know, security into those into those systems. You're talking about huge volumes of code, especially if you have thousands of employees. So it, it does get tricky. But basically, that's essentially that's what happens. We you know we we form contracts on those on those companies and we roll out our infrastructure into into their systems. Um, there are still big companies that use like SaaS GitHub, like just GitHub.com and private repositories. But but at some point you kind of you 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 have a big enough team that you can manage it yourself, uh, you, you know, locally on an enterprise version, and that's really what happens. And and we see and the, and the problem of secrets in those based on our customers, we, we see massive massive uh, amounts of, of of leaks in there, and you know the, the the tricky things is that when you have things like credentials, attackers can validate themselves into services. So you can correctly authenticate yourself into backend s- systems, into networks, into services, and that means that no alarm bells are kind of triggering at this point. So uh, you know you never know if someone's actually made it into your infrastructure and is squatting in there, waiting for the right time to gather information. How long were the attackers of Atlassian? you know, in inside their systems before they announced it. Uh, so this is like r- the really tricky things. And this is why we kind of say that you, you can't, uh, any secrets, any credentials that have been exposed in your internal source code uh, need to be considered compromised. You need to revoke those and make sure that if someone does have access that they don't anymore. Yeah, yeah, 100%, man. Um, uh, the other thing as well is... Um... So obviously that's that's GitHub and that's you know the major player. Um, as you know, there's other similar platforms now available. Uh, Bitbucket you mentioned just uh, just then um, again an Atlassian product actually. Uh, and then you also uh, have your um, your Azure DevOps for example, you know, and you got uh, the one thing that I kind of like about uh, the the Azure DevOps uh, platform is uh, they allow you to have private repositories, uh, even on free accounts. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas GitHub, you you just don't have that option, right? So it makes it harder for uh, you know smaller companies or uh, individuals who are you know coding stuff and using GitHub. Uh, well, basically, they need. Uh, a paid subscription uh, before they can even mark their repositories as private. Um, whereas in, in, in Microsoft, um, uh, Azure DevOps, you can, you can uh, create these. And a lot of people don't even know that for, that's interesting um, yet. Um, I guess that's because everyone just assumes GitHub is the go-to uh, platform for this. Um, so with these uh, other platforms that are much smaller compared to GitHub at this point in time, I guess, do you guys um, sort of dabble in that at all or what's the story there? Yeah, so we integrate with like any v- version control system. It's really interesting. Azure DevOps is kind of the biggest player along, um, 
uh, private companies that we're seeing, you know, outside of GitHub and that, but Azure DevOps really has a, has a, has a growing, kind of growing movement, which is weird because Microsoft owns GitHub and Azure DevOps. Exactly. They yeah. own both of them. So it's kind <laughs> of like, we always assumed that Azure was going to be killed in favor of GitHub, but that it hasn't like not Azure, they're a ser- the kind of cloud hosting, but Azure DevOps, uh, their, um, their VCS. So yeah, it is. I mean, it is really interesting. GitHub is is the place to be for for open source uh, code. I mean, you can create private codes on GitHub for free now. Uh, there's limitations in talking, working in with teams, like yeah. uh, so. When you, so a comp- that's where the limitations of that uh, happen. Um, and GitHub's trying really hard to become uh, the choice for that. They've got like all these security features, GitHub Advanced Security, uh, and and other things, but um, but but to be honest, people are kind of in favor of these other solutions because they're they're a lot more more nimble and, and, and flexible. GitHub is such a huge beast now that you want to yeah. host it on prem. You know, like that's a that's a huge that's a huge undertaking, and you kind of there's there's kind of options to do everything, but but not uh, but not kind of an individual thing. What I mean by that is take GitHub Advanced Security. GitHub Advanced Security does ten things, kind of okay. But if you want to have really good secret detection or you want to have really good software composition analysis, you know, going for best of breed because you have a problem or a security problem or you have a specific scenario where you need to protect yourself. Like with GitHub, that's not the option. It's kind of all or nothing. So that's I think that's why we're seeing a lot of these other players really kind of maintain, uh, you know, kind of their, their, their position in the market. And it's why, you know, like... GitHub's not going to roll over Bitbucket. GitHub's not going to roll over GitLab. They all have their specific niches of, of why they're good. But in terms of like open source stuff, man, it's going to it's, it's going to be hard to to compete with anything with with GitHub. I mean, like uh, years ago, I would have said the same thing about SourceForge. It's like, wow, SourceForge, nothing's ever going to touch it. And then GitHub rolled along <laughs> and killed them. Um, now you're just but, showing you know, your age, mate. <laughs> Holy shit! That's um, yeah. That's like uh, when um, you you were you were probably using Alta Vista for your uh, searching. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I can't even I can't even remember exactly. I remember discovering SourceForge for the first time. I was like, Look at all this code that I could use. Like just for free. There's so much code here. You know, like I was sort of was. The ducks nuts and then <laughs> yeah. Now, like, yeah but the problem with source yeah. co- source forge i think was it was literally just a mess it wasn't like a lot of them were just executables like compiled final product d type stuff and there wasn't much yeah, source it, uh, for sure there's i mean there's like lots of issues with it that github kind of came in to solve but it's you know it's funny like yeah. when you when you think back on it it's terrible but at the time it's kind of you know uh, it was pretty impressive. Well, it was the, I mean, it was the only place. Yeah, it was the place to be. It was the only place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like if you go even go back five years, you look at go onto Wayback Machine and look at YouTube five years ago. Like it's unrecognizable. Like you can't quite remember when when it all updated. But it's like you know we used to love YouTube back in two thousand and nine, and then now it's you go back to two thousand nine YouTube. It's like how did anyone find anything interesting on here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the same for everything. We we we're moving yeah. so quickly. YouTube is a different story. I mean, content wise, they've just kind of exploded as well, right? I mean, back in the day when it first came around, it, it really was just crazy cat videos, you know. Uh there wasn't much yeah. watchable content. Like right now, uh it's such a big sort of a one stop shop now. Like your babies can watch it all yeah. day. Your kids can watch it all day. You know, um, your yeah. uh, whatever. Your gamers can watch it all day, and um, you know, even even your you know the grandpa and grand grandma can watch it all day with just you know random stuff. Uh, but the quality has gone up so much um, that uh, it's quite addictive. Um, you know, it's 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 funny now that in this day and age, it's funny. Um, to watch your sort of, you know, uh, uh, your, your uh, older generations just glued to it. <laughs> I, I, I kind of make, make, make fun of it, but um, uh, I just kind of find it so funny that all the kids are on in the same room and glued to their, to their phones 
and uh, you know grandparents are glued to their phones in the same room <laughs> yeah they're, wa- they're watching different yeah. stuff but they're all doing the same thing <laughs> it, it is funny i was i, was, I have a little uh, a little niece and two little nieces and you know i hang out with them in there one of them's three one of them's uh one and a one of, one, of them, one of them's almost four now so we have four four and two basically yeah. and the four-year-old's like just absolute monster she's hooning around <laughs> all day she's so much fun for an hour and then afterwards it's like exhausting if you're babysitting all day like at some point you just need to get out the ipad and just go like just shut up <laughs> look, at, yeah. look, at your, look yeah. at your cartoons for an hour like i just i need to break i need to break <laughs> like, and it works and, and man it's it like works. It's, it's like catnip it's like catnip i was she was having a tantrum and then i just turned on a tv show i didn't even say anything and she just came and sat next to me and just watched it i was like oh my god yeah <laughs> it's, it's kind of strange like to even think i was talking to my wife the other day i was like how did people do this before ipads and you know yeah. youtube and how did they what, what did they do like and we yeah just and everyone all the young remember find the young parents like, oh. like <laughs> yeah and all the young parents kind of saying, oh, we're never going to do that. You know, we're never going to have the, the kids on the iPad, like, two months later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it works, man. It works, um, you know, and uh, be dinner time, whatever, you know, um, just put it on. And, uh, yeah, it's it's all it's all sorted. Um, road trips, car trips. Yeah, I just can't remember how we how we did it back, back when we didn't have, uh, you know, these portables and stuff. Um, must have been pretty boring, to be honest, man. Like, uh, we would have just sat there looking outside. And uh, especially in a country like Australia, there, there wouldn't, wouldn't really be much to look outside either for hours, right? <laughs> in Europe, it's at least beautiful and, uh, you know, it changes quite a lot. Um, which brings me to Europe, man. So how long have you been there now in, in uh, Amsterdam? I know you started off in France. I in moved. Paris, you were there a few couple of yeah, years. And then yeah, you in Paris. There. So I went. I was in Brisbane for for a long time, and then 2019, at the end of 2019, I moved to Paris. Um, I had a startup in Australia called Compago. It still exists today. It's still running. Um, I'm not involved in it anymore. Um, but uh, so, but when I when we left, still getting that, the money from it, uh, or you completely sold out? I'm still a share. I'm still a shareholder. Oh, okay. I'm still well, a shareholder, but uh, but but. Um, but yeah, it, it's being run by by a different, a completely different team now. And so it's 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 interesting, you know. Like the, the narcissist in you wants it all to fall apart when you leave, but all logical parts of you that you're a shareholder want it to succeed. So you know, like it's, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, but at the end of that, it was you know it was time for an adventure. So we moved to Paris. I had no idea kind of what I would do in Paris, but I was super interested in security, and and I was kind of like, well, I'll I'll I'll, I'll just do. I'll just kind of be a be a bug bounty guy if I. If, Did you have a job back then, life, yeah. or you just packed up and went to Paris? No, I just packed up and went to Paris. Oh wow, that's you with my girlfriend. Huge. So, uh, yeah, yeah, my girlfriend was already there because she wanted to do her masters uh, at, at a university called Sciences Po, uh, oh, okay. science political university. But so then, but then I kind of yeah went to Paris and um, yeah, it was really cool. But then the pandemic hit, and man, you know, you're in tiny apartments in Paris. I mean, we had a we, our friends were impressed because we had an actual bedroom, like we had <laughs> because most most Paris Parisian apartments are studios, yeah, especially yeah, for yeah. young couples, yeah. But even just having the bedroom was was Luxury. like going through COVID. It was like so difficult. It was so difficult to to survive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got it. The lockdowns, the three month lockdowns in your apartments where you needed yeah. what they called an attestation, like a, a form of like why you're leaving your house. You could only go one kilometer. And Paris closed all the parks. They closed off all the parks in Paris for the pandemic to prevent people from gathering. But so that kind of killed the Paris vibe. I stayed there for, I stayed there until uh, officially I was living in Paris November until November last year. And then oh, kind of, okay. that's when I officially moved to the Netherlands. But my girlfriend moved to the Netherlands uh, like a year and a half before that. So I was just, there's a, there's a fast train that goes between Paris and Amsterdam. It takes about three hours. So I was just is on that, that the, train. Is that the famous uh, TGV or? That's the Tellys. That's the Tellys. Oh, the Tellys. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So then, yeah. Uh, so I was just kind of like living on that train, <laughs> like, yeah. going back and forth between Paris and Amsterdam. But yeah. uh, and then they yeah, officially kind of moved to Amsterdam now. Uh, so yeah, but it's been fun. It's really cool to kind of hoon around Europe. There's so much happening here, uh, and you know, there's, it's a bit of a it's a different vibe in terms of tech to to uh, America and Australia. You know, here this here everything's such heavy engineering uh, foundations. And I think there's a lot, lot to kind of learn about marketing and, 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 and other areas of tech in Europe. Like, the, I mean, America and Australia are pretty, pretty fantastic at uh, kind of marketing products and, and moving forward. Yeah. Um, but, but it's a very heavy technical audience here, which is really interesting for me to kind of to, kind of, to be involved in. Not that that doesn't exist in Australia and, and, and America, but it's just kind of, particularly in France, like your engineering is, is just really like, that's what's considered, uh, you yeah, know, that's, that's what's considered proper to become an engineer. <laughs> and, and yeah, yeah. Super that, technical schools. And, yeah. yeah. I always found it much, uh, much, uh, uh, I'd almost say mature when it comes to like community level stuff in, in Europe. Um, they're just way more established in the way they do things. Um, you know, local conferences and uh, tech communities are pretty strong, um, whereas uh, I find them to be a bit too distributed down in Australia. Um, I've found it to be similar in America. Uh, I mean, America, mm-hmm. if you take out the B-sides, half of it's already, more than half of it's already gone, right? Um, that that on-the-ground community type stuff yeah whereas in yeah, Europe, sure. I see like you know besides it's just another thing but they've got so much happening uh all the time i mean netherlands has like at least four or five pretty solid um conferences of their own um you know um hack in the box and stuff like that and then you've got uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, Belgium's got your BrewCon, and there are pretty kick-ass level uh, conferences. Uh, Hack in Paris, they're, they're small, smaller conferences, and the whole big Hollywood type vibes not there. But uh, yeah, that's true. Kick-ass. It's not there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's something I definitely yeah. found in Europe. Yeah, def- I mean, I'd, definitely, it's really cool to have like this have so many communities, and I think the community is very tight knit as well, um, where people are kind of like it's easy to it's easy to kind of really get involved in something, um, and uh, yeah, and, and like populations are so are so dense in, throughout Europe, yeah, you know, like that you can kind of do this. It's the problem of Australia is it's so gosh darn big. You know, like yeah. in the Netherlands, you can get anywhere in half an hour. Like on the train, like it, it, like apart from like way up north, like everything's like half an hour away in the Netherlands. Like forty five minutes yeah. to half an hour. Like that's the that's the entire country. It's the size of like Greater Sydney, <laughs> and, like, and we have twenty yeah. twenty million people yeah. almost here. I mean, where are you? So when you and then you look hours. at it, <laughs> two hours to just yeah, to get to yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I could be in Paris. Like, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Yeah, exactly yeah, yeah and don't get me wrong i miss that about australia like the the, yeah. you've got the expansive kind of national parks and everything is yeah you can breathe a bit but it's a bit crikey when you compare it to yeah. europe it's uh... <laughs> yeah that, that's so definitely there um whereabouts are you in amsterdam now like are you in the main city and uh, where's your like workplace and all that so or my, my office is still in paris I'm full time. Um, re- I'm full time re- remote, so I, I do. But I do. do they know you're in Amsterdam. <laughs> so that's why I said. So officially, I moved to 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 the Netherlands in November last gotcha. year. Gotcha. Cool, and, cool. uh, <laughs> and before that, I mean, everyone everyone knew I wasn't living in Paris, but just it was just kind of like a don't tell HR that Mackenzie's not in the country. <laughs> but, yeah. Now, but, <laughs> I think it's going to be out now with this one, Matt. <laughs> I think everyone is. I think it's official now. That's all they cared about. It's this yeah. plausible deniability that I, you know, like. That, uh, um. awesome. <laughs> cool, cool. And uh, so, I mean, yeah. where, where do you live? You live in the city now, or basically? Oh, actually, uh, actually, actually, kind of ask kind of... Can you smell weed? Can you smell weed where you are? <laughs> <laughs> I'm outside of the the tourist zones. I'm in a really cool little place. 
Oh, that's okay. still got all the canals and everything, but it's not it's not like one of the tourist hubs because that's that that can kill you a bit in Amsterdam if the the misbehaving British uh, stag parties that come over here that, uh, <laughs> that roll into town. Yeah, uh, yeah, easy to spot, easy to smell. Uh, so yeah. I'm just I'm just a little bit outside uh, of kind of of, of of the big show, but it's still it's still really cool. We're looking at we're looking to buy a house this year here, so I'm just trying to figure out where where kind of where to where to go and, and so many options, so many cool places. I found there is a fortified city called Amersfoort where you can kind of get an apartment in this old city wall, like the, there's this big, you know, the big thousand year old city walls that run around, that run oh, wow. around Amersfoort and you can get an apartment in the city wall. My girlfriend's oh, not so wow. convinced, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, <laughs> I want to own part of it. I can't get a castle yet, but I want to own part of a castle wall. That would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll be very interesting uh, to, to actually live in one of those. Um, Last year, I saw this. Uh, I went to this place called Avignon. I don't know if you ever got there in France. It's a. Uh, it's exactly the same, like a walled-in city. So there's just walls and then right, yeah. inside. Uh, that was pretty interesting. Just uh, going in there and it, like you forget you're inside walls because it's the entire city is inside the walls. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, I hope you can you can do it, man. I mean, in, down in Australia, it's uh, getting pretty hard for people to buy houses now because the interest rates are going up every day, basically. And uh, during the COVID lockdown, uh, really low, historically low, um, I've been told, um, uh, interest rates, uh, people spent way too much money. Like they would buy houses that yeah. you, know, you wouldn't like even look at uh, normally and they were paying millions of dollars for them just because – they thought it was so easy to get into that market with those almost zero percent interest rates, and now mm. they're go, starting to go up on a, on a regular basis, and um, people are really feeling it now. So that the real estate market is completely dead here at this point. At this point in time, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. There's a lot of laws in uh, in the Netherlands that prevent you from kind of just kind of land banking. Like you can't buy a second house without like living in it for for X amount of years, and you or, or you if you do is kind of like insane the penalties that come with that, and you, like you can't use your parents' equity to buy a house and and things like that. Yeah. The idea being that that it it's it keeps everything manageable, and it's not really like it's pretty expensive. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It's like everywhere now, but but it yeah. but it's not like the Sydney Melbourne where like it truly is. Like yeah, like you can't get much for under a million bucks, right? Like a million dollars is basically yeah. the, the threshold of yeah. Unless you want a one bedroom apartment outside of town, yeah. I think like it's yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very it's crazy. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, we, I, I guess everyone learns, right? And in Europe, they've they've probably gone through these things uh, a few times in the past, so that helps. But uh, yeah, yeah. Now, good luck with that, Matt, and. Um, what are you uh, talking about at uh, uh, B side Zagreb? So B side Zagreb is going to be talking about the the up and coming report that's uh, coming out on uh, oh, okay. March 9th. Yeah. I'll say it again. So we're going to be going through that. They're going to be the first to kind of hear some of that live and uh, and then get some of the, the fresh new data of, of what we're going to do. So we're going to talk about uh, exactly how how hackers are able to exploit and find credentials on on public spaces but actually have some really cool talks coming up because uh we're we we kind of link research with with another group called cyber news and we are able to to kind of look really deep into into things like our mobile applications we reverse engineer a bunch of our uh, applications from the play store and expose how much of them actually contain hard-coded secrets in the in the in the apk files and the compiled files themselves so huge, uh, lots of stuff like that. So we, we, it's going to be interesting this year because we're going to team up with different people to be able to uh, to kind of go through the process and uh, and kind of show in, in lots of different areas. All right, we know that they're in source code, but where else are they? And inside your containers, inside your compiled Docker files oh, cool. and, and uh, everything else. So that's going to be really cool this year. There's going to be a lot of talks kind of uh, that are going to team up, team up, team up in the air. 
that's that's really cool, man. And um, especially the in the Play Store bit. I mean, there's got to be so much in there. Um, you know, you know, when you stop looking at all those apps in there, and uh, so this this report. Oh, uh, do you guys make it public after the talk, or how how does one get it? Yep, yep, yep. So, so it's uh, if you just type in the state of Secret Scroll, you'll you'll get our 2022 report. Uh, and and yep. the top of that report, there's like a form that's like you know get notified as soon as the, the new report comes out so that will be that will be released made to the public uh for anyone to to download it's going to be super interesting so uh uh for 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 march 9th put it in your calendar <laughs> the state of secrets for 2023 comes out <laughs> definitely uh looking forward to reading it matt and um you know getting to know what's uh, what's happening in, in that that uh sort of uh that world and uh any any plans of uh, it's too early right now, but uh, any plans of coming back, uh, paying us a visit down down here, and probably you know, I don't know for you, a quick visit across the ditch to to New Zealand and uh, <laughs> uh, how's that? Yeah, <laughs> like, well, we'll, we'll, we'll you know definitely going to need to definitely going to try and make it to Australia again this year. It's 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 an interesting place, and I th- there's a lot happening in tech in Australia. Like it feels it feels like a, it's like a very mature a maturing market where you actually have some great stories of very successful startups coming out of australia atlassian go one canva you know like uh, and, and a bunch more so uh, it's it's i think it's really getting kind of a worldwide reputation and, and one of the thing and it's it's i mean if you look at atlassian it's quite a these companies are quite advanced on their technical stack and, and using their latest technology so so it's it's a place it's a place to kind of be to to to, to keep up to date so it's definitely a cool place for me to come i'll definitely try and come there uh i'll definitely try and come there there this year and uh and 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 come hang out in sydney again that was fun yeah that's awesome man we'll look forward to that and um hey uh i could talk to you for hours like 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 i like we did last time when we saw each other in sydney but uh yeah, I think I've taken way too much of your time already, Matt. And uh, I, I think you need to go to work at some point. It's just a morning for you, right? Uh, so, <laughs> look, Matt, uh, thank you so much for for doing this. Uh, really, really great to catch up. Uh, please come back. Um, you know, whenever you whenever you can, uh, would love to do another one with you. Uh, I, I think it's just a just an excuse to catch up with with Matt, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, <laughs> in, in the process, if we, uh, you know, get something um, out there that's useful for uh, some listeners, that's, a, that's an added bonus as well. Uh, so yeah, definitely uh, offer another one soon, Matt, um, you know, and uh, try to come down uh, this year. Hack Sydney will be back, B-Sides will be back. Um, uh, I hate saying bigger and better, because uh, that's really not the point for us. Um, or what I'll definitely say better and you know, in a much more organized way. So yeah, uh, <laughs> invitations open, Matt. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely, uh, I'll definitely catch up with you again. So thanks, thanks for having me on. It's been awesome just to catch up. And uh, yeah, let's do it again sometime. No worries. Thanks, Matt. See ya. Take it easy. Um.